Hey y'all, I'm James Wright, and today we're making a Purple Heart Mallet and setting it on fire. Let's have some fun. We're gonna start off this project with a big block of white oak. Uh, that's some really dark red purplish white oak. Um, am I on the right channel? Maybe, okay, yeah, so a Purple Heart. The big block of Purple Heart. This is three inches thick. Uh, it was a turning blank but I'm going to turn it into a mallet head. I want to make sure I have one good reference surface, especially if you're going to be making this out of something like firewood. That's usually what I tell people when you're making your first mallet. Go grab a block of firewood. It's big, it's chunky, and you can pull things out of it. As long as you get one reference surface you can put everything else off of, then it really comes together. With that first top reference, I'm going to then use it to square up the side to make sure it is down to where I want. With two of them done, then I can mark down uh, four inches. So this is going to be three inches thick, four inches tall, six inches long. And I can mark all the way around with that and then rip it down. I know it looks like the grain's going the other direction. That's just the saw marks I'm actually ripping with the grain here. Uh, when you do rip it, make sure you rotate the block occasionally to make sure you stay in the line. Only cut on the side that you can see. That way you're not actually running off the line on the back side. We can take it back out of that and then plane it down to those marks. We want that to then be square to the other reference face. Before I go any farther, I'm going to mark the reference face and edge so that I know uh, this is the one that I'm measuring everything off of. Because in this one, you really do need to have those two sides that are your reference that you mark everything else off of. So I'm going to go over here to my other hammer and grab an angle on it. It's something around that. It's like around 1 to 9, uh, if I remember correctly. So 9 inches long would be 1 inch off the mark. Uh, it's around that angle. There's nothing particular to it, but having a little bit of anger on there really helps it out and, and makes it more ergonomic so that it strikes the face evenly. I'm going to carry that line all the way around and then cut it down too. Now again, I'm only going to be cutting on the side that I can see. And so you can see I come down an angle and I'm going to go corner to corner and then rotate and come around the other side. I'm actually using a hard point saw. Um, I like using that for big chunky things uh, where the saw mark really doesn't matter. I'm going to come back and clean it off. And so that allows me to, to cut into it. I'm going to come in with a low angle plane and plane from the outside to the middle. And I'm not going to go past the middle. That way I'm not blowing out the shavings on the other side. And I was having a bit of a problem with that. I needed to sharpen it. And I thought, you know what? I'm just going to grab my high angle. And it works perfectly fine. Uh, as long as it's good and sharp, that's, that's all you need. For the last little detail, I'm going to bring in a file and bring it all down to nice and smooth. And you can make this as smooth as you want, but it's going to be a striking surface and there's not going to be a whole lot on there that stays good. So don't worry about making it too perfect. Just nice, smooth surface is about all you need. Next, I'm going to work on the handle. And I have this piece of sycamore that's really beautiful, but it's highly twisted. So if you use winding sticks, that allows you to see where you need to take off material. I can see where's the high spot, where's the low spot, and then come back in. I use my low angle plane as the plane that takes off a lot of material. It's easier to take a heavy shaving with this than it is with a with another plane. Uh, so I'm going to cut it to about the right length. And now that I have one surface with a reference, I can then bring the other sa side down to 90 degrees to that. This had a fairly um, substantial twist in it. And so I'm actually going corner to corner on it, getting it down to the right dimension. After getting it close, I can come into the smoothing plane and really detail it out. Now I'm going to cut it down to width, and for the width on this, I want to be just a little over three-quarter inch. I think I was about seven-eighths. I didn't actually measure how wide it was. I just put it on there. Then I'm going to mark out an angle on this. At the bottom, it's going to be seven-eighths of an inch, and at the top, it's going to be an inch and a half. And that way, we have this long wedge. And so we don't actually have to put a wedge into this handle to hold it in. The handle itself is the wedge. So I draw a line from top to bottom, inch and a half wide at the top, down to seven eighths at the bottom, and it is around 13 and 14 inches long, something of that size. You don't have to be precise on it. There are no specifics to this. There's nothing that has to be dead on perfectly accurate. It just has to be relatively close. Then I'm gonna rip it down to width so that at the handle section, it's somewhere around one inch by three quarter inch. I find that to be fairly comfortable right in the middle. We can smooth out all of the saw marks and get it close to what it is. With this quarter saw and sycamore, it's actually a bit finicky uh, because the, the grain on it kind of goes different places. And so uh, cutting it out just, yeah, it's one you have to be careful. There's a lot of tear out on there. I need to find the center of the block, both at the top and the bottom, and then play connect the dots and draw a line from one to the other. And I'm going to keep that line square to the bottom face because that is my, my reference face on this one. And then I need to mark on the stick where it's going to intersect. I want to move it down about two to two and a half inches. So there's about two to two and a half inches of the handle sticking up past the top. That'll give me a little bit of wiggle room. 
This is probably the tricky part of all of this. I have a center line drawn on the handle and a center line on the block, and I'm going to line those two up and find out exactly where they are. And then I'll put little tick marks on the block where the handle intersects it. And so this is going to create a wedge shape marking tick marks on the edge. I'm going to carry those lines across the face, and those then become how, how long the mortise is I'm going to cut. For how wide it is, I'm just going to put the stick on there and mark that out. Put a couple of pins on there, set the mortise gauge on, and put a pin on the mortise gauge into either of those marks. This way I can transfer the marks from one side to the other using the fence on the reference edge, and I can make sure my marks are exactly where they need to be. I'm going to bore two holes in at the far, uh, the wide end, um, and I bore it a little ways, and then the bit slid over, and it wasn't quite as good, and then one hole at the bottom because it wasn't quite big enough for, for two holes. I'm just getting rid of most of the waste in here. So now we're getting ready to carve this all out, and one thing you have to know about making a mallet is in order to make a mallet, you have to have a mallet. That's right, because whenever you're making a tool, you need one of those tools to make the tool, which, how was the first mallet made? Um, oh yeah, they went into the woods and they found a stick. <laughs> I actually have a video doing that, where I went in the woods with a half-inch chisel and a stick and a strop, and with those I actually just carved a bench out of a tree that I cut down with a half-inch chisel. So whenever you see someone make, using a tool to make the same tool, just realize that yeah, there's always other ways around it, but it's nice to make a mallet with a mallet. Once we get that roughed out to where we want it to be, I'm going to come in with a file and a float and really detail this down, and I'm going to take my time on here. I want to look for where the high spots are in there. I can use the straight edge of the float or a chisel to play the connect the dots from one side to the other, and it lets me see, oh, look, there's a little rise in the middle, and that's where I need to work on it. Then I'm going to do that on all four faces until I get a nice straight line. And then I'm going to work on it and get the handle in a little bit, and then come back and work on it and get the handle in a little bit and work on it a little bit. I probably put the handle in five or six times before I found the fit that I actually wanted. For the patterns we're going to carve into this, I went to Google Images and found something I wanted. And I use Google Paint to then size them out because you can actually put exact measurements of how big you want them to be in the printout on, on Google Paint. Print them out and then stick them on. I just use a double-sided glue. I really like using this method. There's lots of other methods and different ways of transferring. Um, using a, a simple double-sided uh, glue stick works great. For the verse reference, I'm actually going to use um, just a, a, an oval around it and carve that in. And I want to do a bit of a relief edge around uh, the outside. I found a gouge that is the same diameter as the ends of the oval. And then for the straight edge, we can just use the regular straight chisel. I'm going to come in and mark these in a little bit deeper with the knife eventually. But for the lettering, I'm going to be using a V-tool and just following each one around. And you can see where the letter actually gets a little fatter. I'm going to lower the angle of the chisel, and that will allow it to cut a little bit deeper. And you can kind of play with how wide your cut is by what the angle of the chisel is. The lower you put it, the more it rises out, and the higher you put it, the more it dives in. I've got a bunch of videos on carving, or you can go look up Mary May. There's lots of fun things. Don't let carving scare you. This is really, really easy. I'm just going to put a little bit of flaring around the outside with a gouge, and uh, I like how it just makes everything pop out. On the other side, we're going to have a flame, and originally I was going to do the same thing, gouging this in, and I thought, well, what if I used a different size gouge for the small flame on the inside and the large flame on the outside? And I kind of like how it came out. I'm going to use a marking knife to mark out most of this as the the measurements on it change, so I'm not going to be able to gouge it in with a, a gouge or chisel. But the marking knife goes pretty well. I want to make sure I don't go past and blow things out. Uh, once it's all marked in, I don't need the pattern on there anymore, so I can scrape out most of it. I ended up actually going back through and detailing the line down a little bit more um, to bring everything up a little bit sharper. And then you can come through and whatever gouge is on there, you can clean that out with the, uh, the knife. For the small flame inside, I'm going to be using a smaller gouge. This way I have two different gouge um, flare measurements on there, and I kind of like how that came out. It always looks dirty and messy right at the beginning, but if you come in with a knife, it cleans out very, very nicely. And here you can see how it all comes out in the end. Uh, I really, <laughs> really like how this came out. And the nice thing with the, the printing is the next thing you're going to do is grab a card scraper and scrape the surface off, and it comes out very nicely. Um, I like how the the patterns can just scrape off the surface, and it's going to be the next thing you do because you want to get a nice, clean surface. And it leaves you with that nice, buttery, smooth, card-scraped surface. It's amazing what a card scraper can do on a really hard wood. 
from this point on, we're doing a lot of detailing, and I'm going to use the chamfer sled that we made a while ago to put a good chamfer on all edges. I, I generally don't pull this out if I'm doing just a, a quick chamfer on here, but I want all of these to be the exact same. And the nice thing about the chamfer edge is it goes very quickly and easily, and I can also then skew the plane so that I can do the end grain sections on it. On the two ends where the angles are weird, I couldn't use the jig on that because they don't sit quite right, so I had to just freehand those, and it's like normal. <laughs> it's kind of one of those fun things. The jig makes it easy, but it's not necessary. You can do it freehand. Then we can put it together and start working on the handle. I'm going to put very, very light tick marks in just a little ways away once it's driven down all the way, and then we can come into the spoke shave, and I can go from those tick marks uh, and then stay a little ways away from the end. I want it to be square at the end and square where it enters the head, uh, but then round it out halfway between where the hand is going to fit. I want it to feel really nice and clean. I'm going to be using this open-end card scraper to do the little bit of detailing left um, after the spoke shave. And then I can come in with sandpaper, and the sandpaper will actually show me if there's any uh, imperfections on it, and then I can scrape again. For the ends, we're just going to be chamfering those down to give a nice heavy, heavy chamfer on here. I'm not using the, the jig because this is all end grain, and they're so short that the, the jig doesn't have anything to fit on. Here you can see the sandpaper work. It's just 400 grit sandpaper, and that shows you where the scraping mists. Um, it'll show you even better than what you can, you can feel. And then I'll come back and check it and scrape it and sand it again. And just about that time, it's done. We have a mallet, except for uh, it needs a little finish. And uh, yeah, if you're looking at this quarter sawn sycamore and purple heart, it needs boiled linseed oil. So, oh my. Oh my. It's so pretty. Um, yeah, <laughs> I love quarter sawn sycamore and how it just soaks up the uh, the oil. I'm going to put a good bit of on there, let it soak up as much as want, put more on there, let it soak it up. Once it stops soaking it up regularly, then I'll wipe off the excess, put on paste wax, and polish that in. Um, I love how this ingrain just soaks it up and just disappears as soon as my hand pulls away. Yeah. <laughs> beautiful. I really love how this came out. And if you want to see more on finishing, I've got a couple of videos on that. This hammer is, yeah, a lot of fun. And I, uh, I hope that Michael likes this for many years to come because I really enjoyed making it. And I, I love the connection with the verse on there. So really kind of a fun project. <laughs> Happy. I want to give a huge shout out to Michael. He is the man on Patreon. Uh, he is the, the newest member to reach that level. And uh, for everyone who does that, I make a tool in the shop. And so we talked together what we wanted to make and uh, he decided he wanted a mallet. And so this one's kind of cool with uh, Jeremiah 23, 29. Uh, look up the verse. It's actually kind of a, a fun one for the mallet. So yeah, I decided to have a, uh, a good bit of fun with this. He said, you know, I just like the verse, make me a mallet and have some fun with it and see what you can come up with. So I found this block of Purple Heart, and I thought, yes, that's perfect because it kind of has the flame color into it. The extra sycamore on here, I really love how this came out. Um, I, this is probably the fourth or fifth video I've done on making, actually, it's probably more than that, probably like six that I've made a video on making a joiner's mallet. Uh, so yeah, I've got a bunch of them out there. And it's one of those simple projects that every beginner should try. Uh, it is, it, it, it's, it's kind of scary making a tapered mortise that just, ooh. But honestly, once you try it, and understand that the inside doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to fit. This is one of those skills that I love because anyone can do this. It's one that you think, oh, I don't know if I can make a tapered mortise. But once you do it and experiment with it, it is really surprising how easy it is. So I'd encourage you to go out in the shop, have a little bit of fun, and try and make one yourself. If you really want to see more detail on it, I actually have a live video I did a while ago where I did the whole process live. It was about a, a two hour long video. But you can see the whole thing step by step and I talk through every little bit of it. And I really enjoyed that one. But if you do have any questions, throw those in the comments. I do read through all of them and I answer as many of those as I can get to. And I want to say a huge shout out to Michael. Thank you for supporting this channel. You may notice that his name is over here in the man category. Someday we might have to have the woman category. So if you want to, think about becoming a member on Patreon because we are completely sponsored by you guys. Without patrons and members, people who click that join button, the little thank you button down below, thank you. Without you guys, we wouldn't be here. You keep Wood by Right going. You keep the lights on. You make all this happen. And it's because of you guys that we can do fun things like this. So thank you, Michael. I hope you like it. And I think that'll do it for now. Until next time, have a wonderful day. Oh, 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 stop, stop. Hammer time. Don't forget to smash that like button.